loud plane right now. I thought I'd look again at this um, family tree in relationship to these, you know, the Statue of Liberty Washington Monument. I noticed a couple things. James Cooper. Um, first of all, there's this link to St. Vincent, the name St. Vincent. So, um, that name St. Vincent. There's a couple places where I noticed that come up, and this is one of them, where my... Um, second great-grandfather was born you know potentially linking to the artist called Saint Vincent so look what day he was born 8th of June 1848 so when did the Washington Monument start construction I think it was 1848 okay yes Washington Monument Construction began in 1848. Then he was born in St. Vincent, Ontario. Died in 1876 in Ontario. So he's the one who died, I believe, in a canoeing, like a drowning situation. And he was born on the 8th of June. That's my daughter's father's birthday. 8th of June. Um, I think he must have been born since he was six when his mother was killed in 1968. He must have been born on the 8th of June, 1962. So I think there's a possibility that Willie was chosen as a partner for me, partly based on his birthday being the 8th of June. The two children that he had um, with Carolyn Frances Mills before she remarried were Catherine, Susan, Rose Cooper, and William James Cooper. And so William James Cooper is my great-grandfather. He was obviously, I mean, from my perspective, killed with a directed energy attack in 1953. Um, and my mom was around. My mom was a, my mom was born in 1945, so my mom was, you know, like seven or eight years. She must have been eight years old when he was killed, and I think she it might have even happened right in front of her. So that's a trauma. You know, first her father leaves her when she's like two, and then her. Um, grandfather, who's one of the people taking care of her when my grandmother was out working for the phone company, is killed with, you know, a stroke. So he's, you know, suddenly killed. Um, so, you know, you see this pattern of trauma. And these are inflicted traumas. They're made to look like accidents, but they're not accidents. Um, and they traumatize the children. And so they cause... Um, you know, certain responses, psychological responses, physiological responses that whoever operates this system is very familiar with. They know how to use trauma on children, especially. Then Catherine Rose Cooper dies in childbirth. So he's also traumatized. I mean, he's traumatized also in various ways. For example, when his mother remarries, the father drives him out of the house, so he now goes gets sent to a Catholic orphanage where he's abused. He runs away and he's you know takes refuge, being cared for by firemen in Minneapolis and stuff. So he's going through trauma stuff, and then she dies in childbirth, probably is murdered in childbirth, is what it sounds like happened. So she should have been the you know family line, the target line should have gone through her, but that's when it skips over to the male side.
so he at some point ends up in Minneapolis and I'm not sure when he exactly he ended up in Minneapolis um, and then she marries a man named Murdoch the man, man named Murdoch is the one who throws him out and then there's this whole Catholic Protestant issue going on where this is a Protestant Irish family and she marries the man that she marries is Catholic and so um, in addition to there being family conflicts there's also these religious conflicts and now I see it goes back to even further than this to the uh, Massey family you know probably getting a bunch of land in Ireland that must have been taken away from Irish people so you know, that was in the, what, you know, I don't know, 1600s or something. So there's all kinds of craziness going on with all of this stuff. And it's manufactured, okay? This is just all manufactured from above. I mean, that's the thing that's really consistent, I can see very consistently, is that people are basically being set at each other's throats by entities that are higher up on the food chain. And I think that these entities that are higher up on the food chain know exactly what they're doing, and they do this because it keeps them, by keeping people beneath them unstable, and in a state of trauma, they keep themselves in their position secure. And they're also able to steal, you know, continually steal from people. They're, people are always off balance. So anyway, so there's that. So I guess what I was trying to figure out is at what point does he move to Minneapolis? Because if you look at the Statue of Liberty, which was built around the 1880s, she has a reference to the Twin Cities in, um, in the poetry on the, on the statue. So it looks like, it's interesting because it looks like both the mother's family and he ended up in Minneapolis. So the birth, there's a half-sister, according to this, born in Ontario in 1880. And then it says arrival 1880. So it sounds like they arrived from Canada into the United States in 1880. And um, so when was he born? 1876. So he was only four years old. At some point then, he was must have been ousted from the family. I think my recollection, it might have been around eight years old that they threw him out. And I don't know why they would do that, except that maybe they were having so many other children that they just decided to, you know, that... But probably it was more than that. There's probably machinations going on behind the scenes. There's probably the same thing that happens over and over. Someone behind the scenes came in, pulled some strings, paid someone off, said, hey, I see you've got a bunch of kids. I mean, I'm speculating, but it seems kind of obvious. This is a pattern. you got a bunch of kids, you know, let me help you out. I'll help you out. But, you know, here's what you got to do. you got to send him to, you know, he'll be fine. He'll send him to this orphanage. He'll be fine. He sends him to the orphanage. He's not fine. He gets abused, runs away, you know, but... The point is, you've already made the steal, you know. So it, I have a feeling that his parents were manipulated into um, setting him up as a child to be, you know, sent to this orphanage where he would be abused. Um, and then he was set up again after he escaped the fire man. You know, at first they took good care of him, and then it sounds later on they set him up also to be sick and almost die from, you know, being sent to work in sewers. So patterns, really, really solid patterns with this. In any case, it looks like the family moved to Minneapolis or Minnesota in 1880 from Ontario, Canada. So according to this, there are two inscriptions on the Statue of Liberty. The first is the um, Declaration of Independence. The date, it says Sate, interestingly. Um, the date of the Declaration of Ind Independence as seen in the photo of the book that she holds in her hands, which is not just the date, it's also numerology. But one thing that I'm not entirely certain of is when everything's written in Roman numerals, does that change the numerology to something else? Because now it looks like letters rather than numbers, I don't know. Um, in any case... Um, Then there's a poem called The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. And so, of course, when I see New Colossus by Emma Lazarus with my background, I think, oh, Sylvia Plath wrote a poem called Colossus. Sylvia Plath also wrote a poem called Lady Lazarus. Interesting, right? 
written in 1883. That's three years after my father's, my, you know, my mother's targeted line moved to Minneapolis engraved into a blast, brass plaque and put at the base of the statue in 1903. So um, my great-great-grandfather married, I think, in 1900 or 1901. And here's what it says. Um, Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command. Interesting, because my grandmother had a sister named Mildred, which looks like mild red. The air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. You cry with silent lips. Okay, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse, refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. So what does this really mean? Her eyes are mild. Her torch, is a, the flame is imprisoned lightning. Her name is Mother of Exiles. She's welcoming the world wide, you know, which is what they kind of tried to mind control me into thinking that I should do, is just basically spread open my, you know, whatever for everybody to take advantage of me and exploit me. Twin Cities Frame... To frame somebody is to, you know, set them up and make them seem like they, there's something they've done something they haven't done. And so there's this idea that she's welcoming all these people, lifting her golden lamp. Is this mean that was this maybe a um, invitation to be trafficked? Was this maybe something saying that like okay? And I don't know at what point this became a financial thing. If it was always a financial thing or, you know, if it was a financial thing for the past 500 years. <coughs> or I don't know. But it appears to me like this looks like, you know, it's like supposed to be this welcome mat to come, you know, use me, abuse me, take advantage of me. And not just me, but my whole family, everyone around me. That's what this looks like to me. It does not actually look like this is about freedom. It looks like it's about captivity. And there's other ways that this appears like it's the case. I mean, you know, it could be open to interpretation, but I have, I have a sense that maybe they put a veneer on something that was much, much darker. So if you look at the map of the Statue of Liberty, what I see shape-wise, and I don't know how long you know, at what point it was constructed to look like this with the flagpole and all of this stuff. But when I look at it now, as it looks now, from the top, it looks to me like the medieval weapon, or, you know, the weapon called a, the club called a mace, which the family Massey is named for, over, or named for, a mace, which is a club with spikes on it. But it's inverted, and inverted and it's stuck on an island. So that's interesting. Ellis Island is the name of the island. Brett Bowman's middle name was Ellis. Brett Ellis Bowman was his name. Battery Park. So the batteries, when they get thrown out around town, they signify directed energy attacks. Um, but I think it's because, you know, it means battery, like assault and battery, like you're literally being battered by directed energy. Um, and then it's electronic. And, um, you know, it's a park. Park has to do with being parked, like being restricted from movement. Um, then we have um, Port Liberté, <laughs> Pier 11. 11 is the number connected with us. Wall Street. 
so like build a wall. But 11 is linked with justice in the Rider Waite tarot. So I feel, and there's a sculpture garden there and everything, I feel that this is just as much about captivity as it is about freedom. And it's almost like a satanic thing, again, in which this threat of liberty is set into this metal frozen statue put out on an inverted mace set on an island there's a borderline right there so you get this idea of borderline that's one of the things that they kind of want to try to turn you into is borderline personality that's what they do with abuse you know it's one of their goals with trauma-based mind control to turn somebody into like a bipolar borderline or you know I don't think you can turn someone into bipolar but you can you can do it with frequency based weapons but with abuse you can maybe create somebody with like a borderline personality um, and so borderline becomes a big deal because you know a lot of the family um, stuff happened I was born right on the border of Canada up in um, Washington State so I'm just saying you know I'm I, let's just be real I mean obviously this is in there it wouldn't I wouldn't be treated like this if it wasn't if if the Statue of Liberty really were as straightforward as everybody's always sort of made it out to be, I would have been set free <laughs> hell a long time ago. You know, it's it's that this is this is the dark side of it, the the inverse side, the inverted mace and the um, statue put out. You know, the freedom frozen and put out onto an island just for everybody to look at and to use and to exploit. And I mean, you know, I I hope I'm not putting too fine a point on it, but I think that people seem to have a hard time understanding this is exactly what they've been doing to me. They have not been doing me any favors the way I've been treated. So, I mean, I just feel like, okay, if this is what you're about, if you're really about lying about all this stuff, you know, let's call them out. But, you know, maybe you could turn this into something better, something more genuine. Um, I see here on the this other island, Governor's Island, you know, building 555 and Fort J Theater and all this stuff, and Ellis Island. So, according to this, the Statue of Liberty is estimated to be hit by about 600 bolts of lightning every year. Lightning seems to be something that goes way back with this group. Um, the Washington Monument, they were really interested in turning this into a, um, you know, when I researched it early on, it looked like they were really fascinated with the idea of making this into a giant um, lightning rod. That was one of the things that they were into doing. That's partly why they put a metal top on it. And then the very tippy top is a silver, you know, it's, it's aluminum, but it's a silver colored little pyramid. So there's another link to July 4th on the Washington Monument, the cornerstone laid on July 4th, 1848. So similar, I feel that <clears throat> the Washington Monument seems like to me it has similar um, ambiguities to the Statue of Liberty. The numbers are more fives and fifteens, um, but the pyramid itself, atop 55 feet, walls 7 inches, so there's the sevens that are linked with the Statue of Liberty. And then if you look at the interior, in this diagram of the interior, it looks sort of like a, a screw, a giant screw, spiral. 
Um, it also looks a bit like an inverted railroad spike. And then the landscaping around it. So it has this sort of, you know, um, you know, it, vaginal look, but then it's also, you know, this giant, you know, phallic obelisk at the same time. And then it's ringed around with these flags and stuff. So, um, I don't know. You know, I'm not really sure what they're trying to say. I'm not sure if it's supposed to be ambiguous and going both ways at the same time. If there's a message and then a hidden message, it's not clear to me. There's the top. But I do think that beneath this, especially the Washington Monument, there is a hostility towards Native Americans both a fascination with and a hostility towards Native Americans. And it's also in the Statue of Liberty because as you look at the inspirations for the Statue of Liberty, like this is the most, you know, obvious one. Uh, unconquered Sun, Roman, I don't know if this is a coin. It's a disc from the third century. So it's number three again. But this idea of, um, now this is from 1855-56, so this is right after Eureka, California was founded. Um, this idea of Columbia and the quote-unquote Indian princess. So Columbia is this <clears throat> symbol that's been used for the United States. Um, so there's the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. Then there's the Columbia River, which divides Washington State and Oregon. And so those are twins, Washington, D.C., and the uh, Columbia, District of Columbia and the Columbia River. And then... Um, you know, here they have these two women standing, one on the left and one on the right, with this baby in between them, and the baby's, like, got this fruit tied up on ribbons, and in the middle of all this is a um, bust of Washington, George Washington, on a, um, what is that, eight-sided? Yeah, eight-sided um, polygon. So eight represents vision. So I think that this is, you know, they knew that Chris's family was linked to George Washington's family. And so that's partly what's going on here. And then that the women here, one being Native and one being, you know, the white woman, Columbia, I think this is all, this just all worked into their plan. They had this, some kind of plan already enacted when this was created in 1855 in the U.S. Capitol. I mean, these are basically the same women that are in the back seat of Tupac's car in How Do You Want It? It looks like me and my daughter, it, like, quite a bit. Another interesting thing about the Washington Monument is that it was designed by Robert Mills. So that also is um, a family name. My Um, you know, William James Cooper's mother was Carolyn Frances Mills. So she's, she's the Massey family line.
So her mother, Carolyn Mills' mother, Frances Massey, was born in Ireland in 1818. Another interesting thing, well, you know, this is not necessarily related to the Statue of Liberty and all of that, but it's interesting. Um, in my father's line, which is not the targeted line, I noticed if I went far back enough, I ran into the name Zimmerman. Bob Dylan's name. <laughs> And this is, you know, probably um, almost certainly Jewish heritage here, which, you know, I kind of had knew that my father um, had Jewish heritage. But I think this is, again, um, it's significant because, you know, all of these marriages are essentially arranged, arranged marriages, including, you know, whether or not the people who involved in the marriages both know that or not and um there's a big effort by nazis and white supremacists to, to sabotage my family and one way that they feel that you know they can sabotage us is by causing us to have quote unquote racial impurities so by marrying my mom to somebody with jewish heritage you know um the nazis could, you know, feel um, free to take whatever liberties they felt like taking because they felt entitled to treat Jews badly. And then the same thing goes with, you know, having me have a child with a Native American man. You know, that becomes an issue for people. And... Um, It's just silly, you know, but that's how some people think. And so that's, that's partly why they feel like they can, you know, take all these, um, they can exploit us, harm us, you know, do terrible things to us, um, because they feel justified because of their, um, white supremacist attitudes and the Nazis are big architects behind what's been happening to us.